before I get into it, I just want to give you a little bit of a color into the UI and how it is actually structured. At a top level, you can actually see immediately when you log into the system as an administrator or as somebody who is managing or monitoring, um, you know, from an insider risk point of view. There are there is a panel that gives you instantly view into what is going on within your organization. It uh, comes from either daily risk or uh, you know a a possible risk depending on how uh, employees are actually their activities are being captured, uh, any kind of keyword violation violations or any uh, file anomalies. File anomalies could be somebody who has copied files or deleted files. Those are all activities that are being captured, and you can get an instant snapshot if there is any kind of a risk that is happening. And you can click in and go through details uh, as well. So what we have is uh, hundreds of dashboards that we have created, very personalizable, meaning that you know you can actually go ahead and set it up for your own, uh, what screens are, what uh, reports that you would like to see on a daily basis. Monique can actually do the same thing, can shut up her own set of uh, uh, dashboards. What uh, it gives you is the capability to actually go ahead and pick and choose which charts that you want to see on a daily basis when you log in. So as I mentioned, we have what are called threat indicators and we have created category categories. And those categories, each of those categories have multiple set of um, dashboard uh, that we have uh, created for you to pick and choose from. Um, opportunities data theft, whether they're actually copying data to a um, external removable uh, data storage, they're BCCing somebody, they're sending attachments, accidental data leak, all those things are actually part of our uh, dashboard that you can pick and choose and personalize. And whenever you log in, log back in, you should be able to actually see uh, the uh, activity for that particular uh, time period. Right now, I've actually changed that time period from uh, January to March. So it sort of gives you a full month view into what all the different activities that are happening. Now, activities doesn't necessarily always relate to, uh, to insider risk, but as I mentioned, we collect the activity data, we provide you a dashboard, uh, and we use that as part of the behavior profile. So with that, let me do one thing. Let me go ahead and switch to some of the configurations that are available so that you can get a sense for you know, all the uh, configurations that you can do and the richness of all the configurations that you can do. Let me start out with uh, recording policies. You, we do have a capability to integrate with uh, Microsoft uh, Active Directory or some other kind of an LDAP system that you have to be able to import uh, users. Once you have the groups and uh, users imported, we have several different uh, recording policies that you can actually create. Here are some examples that I have. So let me go ahead and uh, pick something. There are all test ones. So what this does is it actually allows you to set it up to record different data points. So login events. Now login events is a very critical one because we actually keep track of the fact that the user is logged in at a certain time, was inactive, uh, meaning that uh, the uh, system went idle because they stepped away for a certain period of time. Most of the devices go into a screensaver mode or some kind of an idle mode. Uh, you know, whether there is a mouse activity or a keyboard activity, all that is going to be captured as part of our, uh, you know, recording. And also which applications they are uh, accessing, which websites are they accessing, you know, what emails are they sending, um, whether they are actually sending attachments, they're sending BCC, uh, or they're actually sending to uh multiple people or there is no activity at all all that is part of uh, the email capture same thing with iam and chat iam is mostly now it's become more prevalent uh, especially with teams and uh, zoom and so on um, we capture all that information keystrokes again this is a little bit invasive as i mentioned if you want to actually ca capture keystrokes of what the user was doing we actually capture every keys that were present uh, that were clicked by the end user again you know, we do have an option to, uh, uh, you know, stealth mode versus not stealth mode. Uh, in Europe, we do have an ability for you to actually see that as an employee to see that there is a uh, icon on the tray that shows that Veriato is running in the background to capture events. Um, printed files, what are the users doing when it comes to printing? Uh, if they're actually printing out sensitive data, data as part of the data loss prevention, and file tracking. File tracking essentially gives you an ability to track whether the user is copying, deleting, uh, and uh, or modifying existing uh, sensitive files. So as part of the other things that we also do is we also capture screenshots. Now, why is screenshots uh, important? 
screenshots allows you to keep track of what the user is doing at a periodic intervals. It's up to you to how you want to set it up. The smallest interval is five seconds. So every five seconds, it takes a screenshot and stores it. So what that does is it actually uh, gives you an ability to see end-to-end -end recording of what the user was doing because we stitch every screenshots we generate into a video so that you can uh, watch what the user was doing at a you know at, at five seconds interval. You can obviously uh, set that up to a much more uh, spread out, maybe every uh, 60 seconds to maybe every 30 seconds. You can actually set it up however you want. But the goal is that you will have the lineage, as I mentioned. You'll have the forensic evidence to identify what the user was doing so that you have, if you have any kind of requirement for regulatory compliance reasons, you have the proof that you can use as part of your uh, uh, monitoring. That is part of our um, groups and policies. So a uh, few other things that I would like to go over, which is uh, activity settings. Now, activity settings is um, you can actually set up different uh, websites and uh, you know that the users can or cannot access. Uh, you can actually set up blocking where you can allow you know prevent the user from going to a certain website by a particular user or a group. So if you were to actually say uh, Facebook.com is not allowed for uh, for IT versus Facebook.com is allowed for marketing because they need it for marketing communications. You can set it up at that level of access so that if somebody from IT goes to Facebook.com, you can either completely block them from going there where they, you redirect them, redirect them to a separate URL where they're uh, educated on uh, you know your company corporate policies, or you can actually go ahead and set up where you can throw a window is just saying that this website is blocked. Again, the goal is to allow a user to understand if they're taking an accidental action uh, so that they can learn from uh, that activity. So we have several of these that, uh, you know, that we have created as part of this example. You can actually set it up such a way that Facebook is blocked, for example, like what I mentioned. But a few other things that we also allow you to do is to set up whether it's a productive application or not. Uh, for a productive website or not. So you can actually go ahead and say that it is allowed, but it's not productive. So that you can keep track of the fact that the user was spending a lot of time on unproductive uh, websites. So that it, again, adds to the behavior profile. Uh, it gives you an idea about what uh, the user was doing, what were they spending most of their time on, whether they were being productive during the day uh, or they were spending a lot of time looking for jobs, right? So all that adds to the behavior profile because the moment you start to see that kind of a change in behavior, that indicates some kind of a potential risk. Right? Same thing that you can do with applications as well. Uh, application blocking uh, is something that we are working on, but it allows you to set up with which applications are uh, uh, productive, which are not. Um, you know, files, which files they can access, uh, they can set a path, um, and as well as uh, the most important one, which is a keyword. Keyword, again, uh, doesn't necessarily mean that it's a single word. You can actually set up multiple uh, words together into a key phrase. What you want to be able to actually do is to track some kind of a key phrase that are relevant to your customers. So it could be related to PII, it could be related to PHI, uh, or it could be something uh, more, uh, you know, common like uh, uh, you know, bad language that you want to monitor to make sure that uh, your uh, users are not uh, insulting uh, other members, other global members. Right. So you can actually go ahead and set up, and also some keywords like if they're searching for jobs, those are some things that you can actually also set up as part of the keywords. Now, why is this is relevant? Again, keyword alerting is also possible where you can actually go ahead and say if the user is using this language or this particular key phrases uh, send me an alert right those are important for us to now you know maintain um, either regulatory compliance uh, requirements or in some cases you know as simple as uh, identifying uh, PII data that uh, you don't want users to be sending across in emails or or chat A uh, few other things, and then I can um, leave some time for uh, questions. We have extensive alert uh, setting capabilities. We do actually provide quite a bit of uh, out-of-the-box uh, alerts that uh, you can use. Um, we have an ability to set up alerts where you can say, uh, send me an alert end of the day, where you're not actually getting inundated minute by minute. Uh, we also have an uh, ability to set up an alert for uh, real time. So in this particular case, let me go ahead and set up a 
uh, alert and as i mentioned the threat indicators are essentially uh, something that you we expect the users to uh, put them under uh, part of the reason is that some alerts uh, are uh, something that we actually export to uh, seam solutions downstream so um, if you actually set up an alert that is not relevant to seam um, or cybersecurity but you do want to actually keep track of the fact that there is a disengagement alerts uh, those are some things that you don't you know we expect to the alert to be categorized under so that we don't send uh, additional noise to your downstream applications okay so in this case let me go ahead and set it up where i have uh, you know i just quickly walk through some things so we have an option to actually set up anomaly alerts where you are comparing uh, the user's data to their own uh, over a period of time. So by default it is 20, but you can actually change that to uh, uh, you know more. What that does is it allows the AI, generative AI, to be able to actually take a look at the pattern and behavior across different data points that are being collected and see if there is any kind of an anomaly. You know, um, today, uh, for example, like, you know, my third last past 30 days shows that I always logged in, uh, you know, using uh, three different IP addresses. One was at home, one was at the local coffee shop or uh, the local uh, uh, internet cafe or whatever that is. Um, the third one could be where I am actually going into um, office a few days of the week, a hybrid kind of an environment. So what this does is it allows us to keep track of the fact that there is a pattern behavior where only these three IP addresses were being used to log in. And I can actually go ahead and uh, identify if a IP address is completely different uh, from the ones that are uh, that you know the system is actually capturing on a on a daily basis. So over a period of time, you can actually start to see patterns, and that pattern is invaluable for us to create a behavior profile. Along with that, we also compare with the user with the with the group that they belong to, because you could potentially have a anomaly of a single user within a group that uh, is taking actions that, they, that the group is not. It could be something where in an IT organization, you have somebody deleting a lot of files where the rest of the group is not. That is what we would consider as an anomalous behavior. Uh, it could be that all, the entire group is, you know, uh, or a you know, few members of the group are deleting several files. It could be some kind of a sanctioned event where they're going through some kind of a cleanup of a server or something like that. So all that is actually part of the anomaly uh, identification. Risk score, I'll explain that in a bit. Compromise credentials. This is a critical one because it allows us to set up. Uh, again, as part of the alerts, one of the things that you could do is you could set up on a specific user or the entire group. In this particular case, I'm just going to go ahead and select all for now. That means that this alert will trigger for every uh, user across the company. So here, these are some of the critical ones that are uh, incredibly valuable when it comes to insider risk management. Stolen credentials and shared credentials is an important one where if you are sharing your uh, login credentials with somebody and they logged in, while you're logged into the same device, or in some cases, you can set up a threshold where you can say within a uh, span of one hour, if the uh, same user logged in in a different location, in a different IP address, that is an anomaly. If the user is logged in and the same user is logged in with a completely different IP address, that is an anomaly because you have an you same user accessing multiple devices. Again, you know, few things that we are building upon, which is location, which allows us to use an IP address or by you know identifying the geolocation. We can start to look at land speed as a potential uh, risk as well, meaning that you know today uh, you logged in uh, at nine o'clock and nine ten or uh, you know, or even if it is you know five hours later, you notice that there is a login that came in from uh, the other side of the world. Physically, you know, impossible for somebody to have traveled within a few hours to a different location. So that is an anomaly. Obviously, is a standard risk uh, for an insider risk uh, management point of view. All that is part of our uh, uh, unusual access. Let me go back and show you event. These are all the events, like I mentioned, we capture. So if I were to actually take into account application activity and set up conditions. So I can actually say that if the user has accessed uh, you know, some application, if it is part of our uh, system, it shows you uh, 
you know, if, uh, in the list from the application list, um, if the user access Amigo, or if they actually set up, uh, you know, they uh, we can, you can set up additional controls where you can say if the user is uh, access Amigo and spent more than you know three minutes or ten minutes on it, then send me an alert. So you can actually go ahead and create uh, without having to understand SQL or some kind of a query builder kind of a uh, UI. Easy to use where you can pick and choose the different uh, functions that are there, and you can build your uh, alert. Again, you don't have to do that. We already have some templates that you can pick from, but I just wanted to give you a picture into what are the different possibilities that are out there. A few other things that I can go through is keywords across where, you know, website searches, websites, uh, you know, whether they're in a, in a file, applications, keystrokes, uh, emails, and chats. You can pick all of these and say that if the keyword occurs in any one of these, send me an alert. Those are all the things that you can actually do. Again, you know, there are a lot of other activities that you can uh, take, which is, uh, you know, what we call as part of the user behavior profile. So there's predefined uh, event. For example, if I were to actually say website and go to sensitivity, block websites visited, I can actually go ahead and set up if as a percentage or as a, a absolute number or a general threshold. So I can actually say that anything that is in green, don't send, don't bother to send an alert, but anything that is outside, send an alert. In most cases, what happens is that the top uh, max is, uh, you get fewer results. And you know, in some cases, when it comes to user activity, you might actually get some results outside this. So you want to be able to actually set that uh, control so that your alerts are triggered outside this range. This is what we would consider as a normal median range of user behavior and anything outside you will actually get alerted. So you can set it up that level of sensitivity if you need to. Again, we do have templates so you don't have to sit down and configure all of these things. All that is uh, part of our uh, product that you can pick and choose which ones you want to use, configure it to a particular user or a group and you're all set to go. So all that leads to another point which is the behavior profile which is risk set. I will wrap up in like two minutes. The risk settings again, you know, we out of the box, we actually say the maximum risk score is 600. We randomly chose it based on our experience over the last 20 years working with our customers. It doesn't mean that you have to stick to it, you can change it. Now, one thing that we have noticed is that uh, different companies have different sensitivity levels that they want to be able to monitor. The lower score like here, for example, 76 to 600, which means that you will get a lot more hits when it comes to high risk. But if you were to actually change that to say 300 to 600 or even 500 to 600 is your high risk score, depending on the company, right? You know, if you have banks, they want to keep it low so that the sensitivity level is high. Whereas if there are, you know, uh, normal uh, smaller companies where they don't really have that level of uh, sensitive data, then they can actually set the numbers up. So that level of configuration is absolutely possible within our product. So with that, there is a lot of other things that I could have gone through, which is risk management. What are the different risk scores that you can generate? Uh, what are the different, uh, so let me, today there's no activity, but let me go ahead and pick something. So you can actually see different users. What are the different risk scores, different risk scores that are happening. In this particular case, this is, uh, uh, we have 50 as a risk score. You can take a look at what the trend is, uh, what is going on, which day was the high score. Um, of why this user uh, profile uh, showed this high risk score. There are different factors that com that combine to create a risk score. We use 27 different factors. And you can go deeper into that particular user for that particular day and look at a comparison of what the user was doing and compare it with the rest of the group. In this particular case, the user doesn't have many other uh, users in the same group and looks like the user profile is on the high side. Um, only by uh, in this particular case, uh, uh, this particular user. So what that gives you is it it allows you to actually do a quick comparison between the rest of the group. If there are anomalies where the group uh, behavior is uh, flatline and where this users uh, you're seeing peaks, immediately you can actually take an action and do monitoring. Okay. So like that, we have uh, all the data is available for uh, you to view at any given point in time. All the raw data is available as well as alerting capabilities, all the alerts, you can take a look at uh, that and as well as screenshot. 